Recording, recording, recording. <clears throat> How are your coughs? <laughs> mm, got some brewing. I'm glad to know you can fake that for me. It means a lot. All right, one, two, one, two. Jeez. This has been a, this has been a tough start. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Share this thing. All right. In the morning with Doug and John. Good morning, John. Good morning, Doug. You know what I was listening to on the radio here? What was this? The kid is hot tonight. (laughs) So hot tonight. (laughs) Were you singing it that loud when you were... When you were driving? Um, I wasn't actually singing along. My mind was just being blown by its wonderfulness. It is a, it is a song. I, re- I remember as a, as a young teenager mm-hmm. hearing that song and thinking, man, I want to be that kid. Yeah. That's I, ironic. I think uh, the guy, the singer, his name is Reno, yeah. last name, uh, was like 47 when he wrote that song. Really? Yeah. He was like quite aged. Yeah. Well, that's, that's hopeful for a lot of us. And the guitar player, whose name I can't remember, was uh, struck and killed by a car while he was uh, taking a walk along the side of the road. Oh, my goodness. I know. Pretty horrible. John, what, why do you share these things? It's just what I know. <laughs> hey, it's been a long week for me. How about you? You've had uh, the most busy week. Yeah. I, I yeah. think of the two of us. It's, it's been an extra couple of days. People have been asking me, hey, where's the Doug and John in the morning installment? Normally comes on Thursdays. Today is Saturday. I, I do hate to disappoint the listeners like that. Uh, we are uh, we are recording this a bit a bit late. Um, you've you've had a very very busy week. Yeah, I, I've I've had to wake up early every day and uh, drive uh, a half hour through traffic, uh, just like a normal like people do have to do every single day. Yeah, <laughs> like, um, a, like a working stiff, <laughs> just like a working stiff, but. Um, yeah, started this new job, and there's a lot to learn. And, um, of course, um, once again, find myself in the position of being the dumbest guy in the room who everybody thinks uh, knows something, um, who is just a little bit more charming than the average fellow. So you all, all those anxieties that show up when someone goes to junior high for the first time or a new job or... Uh, yeah, lots does. of meeting new people and uh, first impressions. And um, well, we've been talking, you know, in the self improvement sections on how to make a good first impression. Mm, and, boy, yeah. And have they been paying off for I'm you at the nailing new job? it? Thanks yeah. to Forbes magazine, yeah. and Men's Health, and uh, <laughs> yeah. have you been going through your routine in the morning? Have you been you've been working yourself up? When, when I'm feeling particular uh, low on the self esteem gas tank, I you know to give it well. A- so you, you used to work uh, a weird set of shifts overnight, but now you're not. Now you're you're working days, yeah, nine to five. Mm-hmm. What a way to make a living, yeah. How does that feel for you in your body? Um, I think it's still some transition. I'm not completely uh, used to used to it yet. Um, like uh, my rest doesn't seem to be as solid. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so. You don't feel. That's curious. So mm-hmm. this like consistent schedule, going to bed at ten thirty or eleven o'clock at night, waking up at seven in the morning, six in the morning. That's not as restful for you as uh, what, yeah, what you accommodated I, to. Well, I just don't think like one week, um, oh. you know, is gonna is gonna change my circadian uh, rhythms that much. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I, uh, some people uh, that I used to work with will stop by my cube. Oh. Um, as they're leaving or you know coming, those poor souls, and uh, they'll they'll be, they'll go like, "Hey, I hear you, <laughs> yeah, I hear you got that job," and they always go, uh, "Okay, okay, yeah." <laughs> <laughs> it's as if it's in the list of the things that don't make sense today. Yeah, like like this one guy yeah. goes, "I didn't know you had any IT experience." I'm like I don't. <laughs> oh. oh, oh, okay. Like, why do they hire you, you yeah. dumb yeah. bastard? Yeah. yeah, and you're hearing that narrative in your head the whole day. Aren't oh, you? Yeah. oh Some yeah. Th- sometime they're going to be on to you. Yeah. Yeah, it's the thing that in my 20s and 30s was hanging around my head, and I really thought was gone when you got to be an adult, a real adult, mm-hmm. whatever age. So I, I think 51, 52 is a real adult age. It seems to be. Uh, and, and happy 52nd birthday, by the way. Oh, thank you very which much. Which also happened yeah. uh, this week. Yeah. Um, and so as a, you know, 51, as I am 52, as your more experienced self is, 
that still hangs around that idea. Some they're, they're going to find out. Yeah, that whole imposter thing. I mean, it is that you're a fraud. Yeah, but I mean, you just and I think like going into this, like I was so desperate to get out of that position Mm -hmm. um, that I'm like, look, I just gotta, I just gotta pretend I know what I'm doing and just and just nail this. Yeah. And uh, and I, I did in the interview and all that. So now I just gotta <laughs> just gotta keep that, gotta that keep phony the... BS going That's for right. another six years. That's right. Till you can reach retirement age. Oh my god! I don't even know what new retirement age is. Yeah, I don't know. Either. I 62. too have had a uh, I've had a busy week. Um, I, I, I've been launching. Into Sorry, this. here I am. Like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll throw right. that. I'll throw that back to me. <laughs> good, good work, working man. Now, uh, uh, now that you've heard uh, all about me, yeah. What do you think about me? <laughs> uh, I have had a very busy week with this great project that I'm working on. This this new organization we started called Vote Common Good. It's a 501c4. If you want to talk about you know the ins and outs of nonprofit organizations and the ones that can be engaged in community formation, development, and political action. Oh, I started see. one of those, Vote Common Good. Yeah, so you don't get as much of a credit when you give to your organization? Yeah, so that's the thing. Nonprofit uh, is a big category that, that first has to do with, is the organization itself tax-exempt, mm-hmm. for which the organization is mm-hmm. the political nonprofit? Right. Another kind of way of being nonprofit is that if you give money to an organization, that organi- the money you give to that organization, you can take off of your own personal taxes as a contributor. Mm-hmm. This kind of organization does not allow you to do that, even though it is not taxed itself. So it's not a charitable organization, but it is a nonprofit organization. It's quite complicated. Mm. Most of us only know, we don't, we don't really know or care, right? Like we just think nonprofits are places where people are not extracting a profit and that's what we care about. So there's some technicalities in there, but I started this, uh, this, what if your religion was politics? If it, if it involves <laughs> a, a, as like say the Southern Baptist or the national association of evangelicals, there, there's our, uh, and, and, and increasingly more mine, uh, I will have to admit it's, um, it all has to do with how you spend. It all has to do with how you spend the money. What you spend the money on. If you're okay. going to spend it on politics stuff, mm-hmm. the politicians are smart enough to say you you still got to pay tax on that money if you contribute it to a. To one of the sure. Groups. So anyway, so I'm doing that, and a part of this includes a big bus tour, a big barnstorming the nation tour. Forty six selected locations so far. Really, twenty five states, eight weeks. Well, I'm impressed. I thought this was just, I mean. Uh, Fair enough. <laughs> that, that, let let with, me have it. With you working on it, Doug, I thought it was going to be much smaller. I thought it was going to be penny ante poker, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, so did I. It's blown up. We don't yet have the funds raised that we need to make this thing go, but we're hopeful. Mm-hmm. Uh, I almost said confident. We're hopeful and, um, <laughs> and is... uh, it, a long way from being confident. Yes. Uh, that that we're going to get it, that the money is going to uh, that the money's going to land our way, that things are going to finally break our direction, that things are going to happen the way we need them to happen. Yeah, all of those things. Uh, so anyway, uh, vote common good. We had one of our cats involved with us on MSNBC on Sunday. That was real fun. Or on Saturday, mm-hmm. that was really fun. Uh, we launched up a real quick website because we knew that he was going to be on there. Oh, and... somebody was like um, on the you know on the news or something. Yeah, they were on the news. And uh, they were on uh, a morning joy with uh, Joy Reid mm-hmm. in the morning, talking about uh, a number of things. Uh, if, back then, it was why Jeff Sessions. This was just last Saturday that Jeff Sessions was trying to defend the Trump administration's separating of families on religious grounds. So they had a couple of religious people on. Frank Schaefer, one of our cats, oh yeah, was on there. Um, uh, with two other guys who are going to be involved with us in this tour. And they were uh, they, they were talking about that. And Frank did a really nice job of talking about uh, Vote Common Good. So people uh, in the morning on a Saturday watching that TV show went to VoteCommonGood.com and clicked on a link and sent us money instantly. I was, they did? Uh, they, they did. While it was happening, I had my computer in front of me, and I'm watching my email. Bing, 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 bing with donations. Damn! Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it did. It wasn't. It wasn't all that much. 
Uh, but it was <laughs> a mean, lot. Right. Yeah. I mean, somehow it was a lot and not all that much at the same time. Uh, maybe if you know Frank would have tried harder. Yeah. If he if he had really really <laughs> dug down and come back to it at the end of the show and asked him for one more one more uh, trip around with the donations. So this you need to get a former pro. You know, uh, you need to get a Pentecostal in there to yeah, raise that money. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, that's been super exciting. And then on <clears throat> Thursday, summer mm-hmm. solstice, longest day of the year. I ran yeah. this little fundraiser. Uh, called the Walk Run Roll. Got a ripping fight with Robin that day. Uh, oh, you did. It was like the longest day. <laughs> Just you were fighting all day, yeah. sunrise to sunset. <laughs> one of those things where you say, "I've committed to not letting the sun go down on my anger." So right. don't ha- don't have a fight on summer solstice. Let me tell you, <laughs> FYI, pro tip. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that that would be a nice pitch. Hey, yeah. if if you're one of those like, I don't want the sun to go down on my anger people. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, sorry you, about today. <laughs> you can say, let's sleep on it because that's not going to happen for another ten hours. <laughs> it's a, like you know, late December. It's mm-hmm. a good time to have a fight. Yeah, right. Anyway, uh, so on your yeah, solstice, yeah. Was... So I'm, so uh, we did this project where we asked people to put a team together and to have each uh, have people on their team take each hour of the longest day of the year. 15 and a half hours here in Minnesota, 526 a.m. to 903 p.m. And we asked 15 and a half hours, asked people to put a team together. People would take on an hour. They would walk, run, or roll during that hour. For the privilege of participating, they would contribute $25 for their hour. They'd sort of buy their way in and maybe get some friends to chip in some additional dollars. And then to stay moving all day. So each team was raising $375 for a team, you know, in the 15 hours to raise money for uh, nannies at an orphanage in Guatemala where they care for kids that suffer from HIV and AIDS. And um, let's just say people who are listening to this now, Doug, if they want to contribute to that cause, how would they do that? Great point. Longestday.us. They'll see a donation link there, and they can click on the donation link and contribute to these kids. I mean, the whole reason for these fundraisers... it's possible for religious groups to do some good things. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of atheist groups that are caring for for, uh, AIDS orphans in Guatemala, so... No, hang on a minute. <laughs> no, there's none. I don't think there's I know shits. of any. But plenty of them will complain about the work the rest of us are doing. So thanks for keeping us. Yeah, thanks for keeping uh, our, well, our, our pencils. Well, congregation's atheist anyway, Doug. So I <laughs> guess there's some in there. <laughs> thanks for keeping our pencils sharp. <laughs> So what was uh, what did you raise in, in all well, of that? Well, I don't I don't have the final totals. Okay. Uh, more than two thousand oh, dollars. I think somewhere under three thousand dollars. That's like great. That's that great. I was a team under myself, which is why I'm a little tired. Mm. So I started uh, moving at just why well, I had to get down there and all, but uh, officially at five twenty six, and then uh, didn't uh, started running at five twenty six and stopped running at nine oh three, and in between there I walked and rolled and did some other running. So I walked, ran, and rolled for 15 and a half hours. Somewhere over 50 miles total, 16 or more of that, I think on a bike and about 30 or 34 on my feet, which for my uh, current place of being a year out from a hip replacement, as the old men like to say, <laughs> uh, I was really thrilled that my body held up, feels good till this very day. That was just 48 hours ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, feeling pretty good. But I can feel that tired sense that I get after I do these all day long uh, running or uh, walking activities. And I'm sure you're not one who was like going to take a nice recovery day the day after. Your, well, uh, I did a little bit. I slept in yesterday and then went to Original Pancake House. Uh, so, Doug, why would uh, I, not to pimp this thing no. anymore for you, but no, um, right. um, why are nannies needed for orphans in Guatemala? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I <laughs> mean, is, is good help hard to find <laughs> good, okay, for uh, the uh, elite Guatemalan millionaires? So, uh, uh, good help is hard to find in a lot of places. The, there is in Guatemala, as there is in the United States and a lot of other countries, a real bias and fear of HIV and AIDS. There's a real disregard for orphans of any kind, as there is in many countries. Um, so <clears throat> trying to gra- garner attention for who's going to care for these little ones anyway that have been sort of forgotten. In this particular case, it's, it's young Catholic nuns who've taken these kids on. And God bless the young Catholic nuns for all the good they do in the world. But what they tend not to be very well educated in is Is child development. Mothering. Mothering. (laughs) There's there's some things about being 19, 20, 21-year-old, you know, Carmelite. And um, 
not may, maybe not having the greatest of personal experience in, sure. in being cared for and, and all the rest. So they didn't really know what they're doing. So mm-hmm. we we've we've partnered with them to help in some education that they wanted and to put some uh, particular nannies in place to hold these little babies because uh, actually physical touch. Yeah. There's a lot of theories about how you, how a human develops, and um, what, one of those is to to just keep babies safe in a crib. Mm-hmm. The other is to hold them. And so we're helping uh, to shift from the safe in a crib storyline to holding them. So it's really good. We've been doing this work for a long time and uh, support this orphanage. And um, it's uh, it feels really good in, in, a, in a day, in a week in which the country, uh, the United States was embroiled in a conversation about how should we treat Guatemalan kids showing up at our borders with their mothers being separated and put in a detention camp. Felt really good to be helping Guatemalan kids who are in an orphanage and can benefit from the love and care. Like it was, it was, it was, uh, we would have, we were scheduled to do this on that day anyway, but it just added some real, some real beauty and synergy. Oh, well, well, good on you, Doug, and bless your little Jesus heart. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And you can, you can atone for all kinds of things with uh, contributions oh, over at longestday.us. I don't know what, what, you know, that's what I'm talking about. What somebody needs to atone for. Uh, cause this is what I love about, about non-religious <clears throat> people as I, you know, find myself in the company of, and, and a member of it a lot, a lot of times is I don't want a narrative by which I have to like try to guess at what the magical gods would do to atone for any, uh, misgivings or shortcomings or undoings that I have been engaged in. I don't want to feel like I'm, you know, in some economy of that. And I, so I like my humanists. Uh, uh, friends who say to me, no, it's right here and right now. Don't think about that other time in that other world, that other place. Don't, don't, don't let that be your motivator. If that's all that motivates you to do good right now, well, what's the matter? What's the matter with you? Mm-hmm. You should do it because it's right. Yeah. Then you hit them with a fundraiser to help these kids. and like, yeah, it's not really my thing. <laughs> you can see why somebody would turn up a little. Well, if you don't pay now, you're going to get a kick in the ass later. Yeah. You can see why someone would make that argument. Sure. Sure. It's very motivating. It's it, it because the other motivation of we need to fix all the things right now tends to be a little mm. depressing. Yeah. In fact, I've got a little tip for you from uh, uh, an author who says that there's 240 minutes a day that separate the rich from everyone else. Two hundred, okay, 200, 240 minutes a day. I don't know why he picks such a, such a four hours. That these four hours you spend, yeah. See what math I did for you there. These four hours that you spend, well, yeah, separate I, you from everyone I, else. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> The four hours an unemployed person yes. spends at home yes. is less profitable than the uh, software engineer or you know the CEO of whatever is spending at you know his you know his yeah, suite. Hey, uh, you work. said you said you've been watching the news. What's what's captured your attention this week? In the, in the uh, news well, you... I'm I just been well. Okay, so I mean, uh, just, some weeks just the. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the things happening in, in Washington are just so uh, potent, overpowering. Everything else seems, you yeah. know, seems uh, trivial. However, something did happen that um, uh, kind of like tugged at my heart a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, this week, uh, the death of Coco the Gorilla. I know. 46 years old. Yeah. Wow. And, um, you know, he could, uh, I don't know, forgive me for not doing the research, but he could uh, save several hundred words, I think. Yeah, uh, through, uh, one through, of them was, I'm through. dying. <laughs> what, what, you at the end? I think I'll go for the a last, walk now. Uh, the last two? <clears throat> what were they, night-night? <laughs> yeah, that's cruel. Why am I making fun of a... I told you I was sick. Yeah. Is that, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but... Um, uh, they once asked Coco to describe uh, an earthquake, uh-huh. and um, and he described it: um, large floor, big bite. Oh, which like wow, yeah. like that's some processing that's right. going on in the little gorilla's brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Coco the gorilla is dead. There and there are no other famous gorillas to follow Coco, right? Like he was uh, it, right? Well, like he, he had really, a forty-six-year run. I mean, yeah. he's got quite the lead. He really chewed up that category. That's right. He wasn't I mean, the letting next, anybody else in. Next gorilla is going to really have to. I don't know where are they going to come from. Have to speak the words or write them out. I got a little rant on this uh, Melania Trump jacket thing. All right. 
Have you been thinking about this? Did you pay attention? Did you see it? Did you, did you, did you know what happened? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of people at first, I thought it was uh, photoshopped because um, the message was so <laughs> so tone deaf. Um, and then my second thought was like, well, maybe she doesn't know English that well and doesn't realize what it yeah. says. Yeah. I, I made that same that same conclusion. And I, I thought, think like, both is, of them were wrong. Yeah, but would have been a better <laughs> right. option than, <laughs> reality what, than what I can come up with. So here's what I can come up with. Right. Tell me which tell me what you think is going on. Because I definitely want to hear all of your thoughts on women's fashion. It's not on women's fashion <laughs> generically, of which I have very little to say, other than they have a distinct advantage over the male fashion. It, one of the options is that she wore this jacket and she thought there was something cutesy about the jacket's point of I'm a $39 jacket and I don't really care that I'm not high fashion. Do you care that it's not high fashion? Well, that's the problem with you that that maybe that's what the jacket is saying. Maybe Mm. the reason they sell this jacket is that the torn jeans philosophy of fashion. Right. I don't care. I, I'm willing to wear utilitarian $39 jackets. I don't have to wear a $1,000 jacket to be somebody meaningful. If you're looking at my jacket and you're thinking, what a trashy jacket, I really don't care. Maybe that's the point of the jacket, right? Let's say. Mm-hmm. Now, why that doesn't work for Melania Trump? She does care about what she wears. She's a <laughs> former fashion model. Her daughter-in-law runs a fashion company. They explicitly care. Her wardrobe is so carefully curated that if that's what the message of the jacket is, which I am guess I'm just assuming that on, the, on the, the market, that's what they're getting at. It doesn't mean that. So if it doesn't mean that, then what could it mean? Well, it could mean what Donald Trump says which he wrote in a tweet that night when he heard the the Mm. outrage, because, boy, that guy's got some time on his hands. I mean, talk about somebody who's willing to curate a Twitter presence. Yeah. Way to go, commander-in-chief. Way to sit around writing tweets. Mm. Wrote something to the effect of what she meant by wearing the jacket, which, by the way, her own press spokesperson said she didn't mean anything by wearing the jacket. Then her husband says, no, no, no. What she meant by wearing the jacket was, I don't care about the fake media. That's what she meant. So if that's what she meant, having never ever said herself about the fake media, that the fake media is what she doesn't care about, then Donald Trump, his definition of the fake media includes the New York Times, CNN, the Washington Post, the LA Times... If what the first lady is saying, as a surrogate, I'm not talking about the wife of the president, somebody who operates in public spaces as FLOTUS, first lady of the United States. And, well, and that was the role that she was playing in going down to the detention camp. She was, she was acting as a surrogate, having been out of the public eye for weeks, mm-hmm. comes back into the public eye specifically to get on a, uh, a special airplane at Andrews Air Force Base to fly to the southern border to be a surrogate for the administration. So she's in that role. I'm not talking about, I'm not picking on somebody's spouse here. I'm talking about a surrogate for the administration. If what Donald Trump said is right, that she wanted to be making a comment about the fake media and her response to the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, CNN, NBC News, ABC News, all of those people are the fake media that Donald Trump has called them the fake media she doesn't care that there's fake media in our country. Is that possible? If the, if the, the first lady and the president thought that there was a fake media onslaught that is dishonest and that journalism in the United States that we all think is protected by the constitutional First Amendment rights, that that's something that is fake and designed to to disrupt her husband's presidency with fake news and her response is i really don't care that's almost worse than saying i really don't care she should care like why would she she should stand on the on the the stairs of the airplane turn around and say to people i really care about this 
The fake news media is lying to the American people. They are an enemy of the people, as the president called the fake news. And in the categories, this list, we have to stop them. They're eroding democracy. <clears throat> if that's what she was referring to as the fake media, the, her, along with all the Trump administration, should spend every day doing what we can to stop the fake media from destroying democracy in this country, if that's what they really believe. So if it's not that, what could it possibly be that she doesn't care about? I don't think she means it's the kids. I don't think she thinks I don't care about the kids. I think the only reasonable conclusion is these people are so dense, so incompetent, so out of touch, they don't even understand that the bad girl attitude of I'm above it all doesn't work when you're the first lady getting on a plane as a surrogate. I think they're just truly this dense that they don't know. And I'll make an argument for why in a minute. Well, it seems uh, <clears throat> you kind of saw a similar, a similar vibe uh, with the um, uh, Steve Mnuchin's wife. Uh, when she would uh, post pictures of herself getting off of Air Force One and then would tag all of the, you know, Gucci purse, you know, <laughs> Prada shoes. Yeah. I mean, you know, like like stuff that's just out of the reach of, of you know, of normal Americans. Yeah. Um, as the wife of the secretary of the treasury, yes. you know, the man whose name is literally <clears throat> written on the dollar, five dollar, ten dollar, twenty dollar, fifty dollar, hundred dollar bills. Right. Right. His name is on there. She's got pictures of her holding that up with her husband's signature on it and being like, here's my Gucci purse. The, 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 there, there is a kind of incompetence. I know Republicans say this all the time, libertarians, especially the government's full of a bunch of incompetent, stupid people. Trump would say this. They're right now. It is full of really incompetent people. You know, the executive order that Donald Trump signed that's going to be challenged in the courts because it violates standing court rules that was designed to keep families together and held in detention, right? This thing mm -hmm. that he signed the other day. Maybe you saw it, that it's a, a actual executive order with a name and a title and then pages in a book, and he was signing it, and he had the, the uh, Kirsten uh, Hansen standing behind him. Kirsten Nielsen. Hansen, Nielsen standing with him. The vice president standing over his shoulder looking in the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the toy soldier fashion that he does. It was called the, end, the executive order to end family separation. Executive order. They spelled separation wrong. <laughs> John, they spelled separation wrong. It, I've it, had to spell check that word a couple of times. I've had to spell yeah. check the word. I'm a, look, <laughs> look, I'm a notoriously bad speller. That's why I know all the tools available for being a bad... The one time you don't want to spell things wrongly is when you're going to make them public. Mm -hmm. So when you're signing an executive order, send it through spell check. Did, did Health and Human Services Secretary or Vice President of the United States not look at it and say, I think separation is spelled with two A's, not two E's? <clears throat> Yeah. So I'm not putting it on them that someone <clears throat> could have a typo of separation, but everywhere I spell separation on every device I work on, it underlines it in red if I spell it S-E-P-E-R-A-T-I-O-N. It, it shows you. Literally, get Grammarly and run it through there when you're going to write an executive order. And this is the thing. It's not just that. It's over the number of of executive orders and professional or and uh, official statements that have come out from the White House that have typos, misspellings, wrong words, wrong names, wrong names of their capital of of their of their uh, 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 cabinet members. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Like the number of mistakes just across the board are extraordinary. Never seen anything like it. And that's what actually led to their incompetence. The sheer cruelty and incompetence is what led to them having a policy that was going to separate children because they didn't actually know that it was going to be a so thing. damaging. Yeah. They literally didn't know. Jeff Sessions, I truly believe him when he said on the Christian Broadcasting Network, two days after saying, if you bring your family, your children to this country, you run the risk of being separated, then said... We didn't intend to separate families. <laughs> they didn't know. The, yeah. Jeff Sessions is truly an incompetent person to be the Attorney General of the United States. 
Well, yeah, and the sad thing is that uh, the the results of that, um, uh, well, obviously with the kids, but I mean, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, government people and ICE is folks who are suddenly like, okay, now you've got to deal with this. Yeah, right. You've created sure. this enormous problem. <clears throat> now what are we going to do? Um, you know, I think, uh, so like, you know, the whole uh, drain the swamp notion and, and all of that is as romantic as that, um, uh, as that sounds, um, you know, that they're, uh, uh do ex- uh, exist, uh, or used to exist in the white house. Um, uh, people who, whose jobs it, w- it was to do things, to make the things run protocol people yes. and, and, and what have you. And um, who you know who have really no political affiliation. They're you know they they're not in those roles like as appointments necessarily. They're just like you know right. got hired for this job. And uh, but I think um, you know when the when the Trumps got in there, um, you know they viewed all of the people that had been there under the Obama administration yeah. as um, you know as um, enemies enemies. And got rid of a lot of those people, and you could just see that in these, um, you know, gaffes that happen yes. over and over and over again. And you could hire good people to do <clears> this. <throat> I mean, we were promised mm. by the candidate he was going to hire only the best people. Yeah, and I think he does. I a, a lot of a lot of bosses only hire people who are not as good as they are at their job. That's a real common thing. Not bringing up your new job as a as a particular indicator of this, but some bosses are only comfortable hiring employees and those who work around them who are not better at their jobs than the boss is at the boss's job. That's a very common problem and uh, 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 rampant in the ministry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, no uh, better, yeah. no better indicator of that than uh, the, the locally hired youth pastor. Or, yeah, or uh, the uh, charismatic worship leader. Yeah. Right. I told you four songs. <laughs> uh, so I think that uh, Trump has hired the very best people he could hire, <clears throat> and they're totally incompetent at what they do. And, and they're and they're so uh, in my in my mind. And I know that to his supporters, they're whatever they think this is all great, but they're so out of touch with what the the role of the presidency should be. I mean, Donald Trump, when he was in Minnesota uh, <clears throat> this week, mm-hmm. you heard about this one where he's insulting these, the, the, the protester. Yeah, yeah. Starts yelling at him about his man bun and his long hair and go home to your mama's couch. His children literally have worked for him their entire lives. Yeah. <laughs> for some guy to yell, go home to your mama who takes care of you, when he funds the life of his children... Through his shell companies that are that are uh, pass throughs for Russian money, it's unbelievable that that's the thing you bring up. You know, or I mean, that same could be said for him. Yeah, yeah, he was running his dad's business. Why don't you go back to your daddy's little popcorn stand and sell some of his? It's unbelievable. Did you see this thing? Then he turned the whole conversation about families being separated to we have to protect people in the United States from murderers that cross the border conflating the actions of some people with all immigrants. I mean, we all know how totally insane this is, but for him to be able to use the presidency to pitch these ideas that letting people into the country legally is a cause of, because the people that he's saying caused these murders were people who came in legally and then overstayed their visas, committed crimes, murdered people as murders happen mm-hmm. in this country, and then tried to say, that's why we have to close the borders and build the wall. And at that meeting, people were holding pictures of their, of their children that had been murdered. He signed their pictures. Here's pictures of them right here. You can oh, see it. Look Jesus. them up online. There's a picture of someone who died. What did I, Donald I, Trump say? I don't want to see that. It's turning my stomach. To literally. the families, would you like me to sign this? And the families were like, um, like not really. It wasn't really looking for your autograph on my child, dead child's picture while you're using. It is so unbelievable. Like if these are not high crimes and misdemeanors to the human spirit and to the American conscience. It's, it's, here, it here, just, it, it gets, it truly at, 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 at like real levels of children being harmed, real levels of trade wars that are hurting people all over the country to just insane things like not being able to spell as an administration and thinking people want you to sign their dead child's picture is ju- it, it is the most, uh, degraded act, uh, acts of the presidency that I can imagine. It's just, 
Um, I think there's a uh, you know there's two uh, two things that two lies that have been swallowed here and um, and, and I, I saw this with the uh, the first Obama election was that um, the, the two things are number one that um, poor people are lazy and that's being continued you're saying yeah, oh yeah so the you know the notion that people who um, who can't afford their health care. Um, or, uh, you know, who need assistance, um, with, um, you know, with the rent or with food or, you know, uh, childcare, different things like that, that they're somehow lazy and the same examples, you know, can be given. You could, you know, you could pull, you know, uh, you know, lots of examples of uh, freeloading people. Yeah. Um, and then there's this, um, this kind of, uh, uh, misunderstanding of like you know you, you could you know see someone like at uh, uh, um, and then there's this uh, sorry what's sorry. What, what's happening here I, I, are you're, you is that, have, you're caught in a huge loop okay <laughs> um, you can see people pictures of people like in the unemployment line or at uh, you know food stamp place or whatever you know with uh, with iPhones mm-hmm. you know like well how does this person usually a person of color mm-hmm. you know afford an iPhone yeah. you know yeah. I mean, it's like, well, you don't need to be rich to own an iPhone. No. You just need to have a rich friend who yeah. can get you on their deal, Doug. Yeah, wink, wink. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, I mean, and so, so that's, and so then that is used and is, yeah. and what's funny is like a lot of people from my hometown, which is a very working class, um, have a lot of conservative um, um, leanings there. And so then they look, they don't like those poor people taking benefits, you know, when, uh, when a lot of my folks are just, you know, yeah. a mill closing or a paycheck away from being in that position of needing that themselves. Yeah, right. right. Um, and they somehow look at their efforts. Hey, I'm working. I'm, you know, you know, so there's that. And the other is that, uh, that immigrants are, are criminals. Yes. And I, and I heard this back when, uh, you know, when, uh, Bush, uh, Bush two second term yeah. with that Michael Savage on the the Patriot and mm-hmm. gave out this list of diseases and things that were that immigrants you know bring into um, into the country, which is so ironic. You know that I grew up being taught, uh, you know that we are a country of immigrants. We're the great melting pot, right? Yeah. And that uh, we would view those you know coming in in that way. Um, However, the problem is that the, the conservatives can we can look to Europe and see that they're having some real issues with the uh, with immigration over there. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it's just but that's what's supposed to make America extraordinary is our capacity and ability to make accessible the American dream to everyone. And that's what's supposed to save the day. That's the whole storyline here, right? Is that we're not just that. There's something special here. And that's, that's why, not just why people want to come, that narrative, but we're trying to work up a different storyline than simply segregated tribal uh, refugee groups living in little separate hamlets all over uh, European cities. That's the, we're trying to do a different story. And this is the thing that gets me about Democrats being one, is that we... There's not an argu- a pushback argument being made to say, we don't need to close the borders. We need to open the flow of immigration into this country so it happens more quickly, more accurately, and more effectively. The answer is not to close the hole. The answer is to widen the path so that all people who should be immigrating into the country can easily and effortlessly and the most inexpensively as possible. That's what you want. So then you can spend all of these resources you want to spend making sure that people who shouldn't immigrate into the country don't immigrate. But what's happened right now is but when you put up an enormous, enormously tight mesh in this metaphor, you don't get enough flow through, so you're <clears> getting <throat> a big backlog and a flood. <clears throat> the reason that there's so many people in line for their immigration is because it takes so long to immigrate. That's the thing we need to open the flow. The whole mm-hmm. argument 
And my political campaign is going to rest on this. Yeah. It's going to rest on saying what we need is more immigration into this country. The immigration numbers are too low to fuel our economy in this country for the next 25 years. Birth rates are in decline. Because you know what? Every good economy is built on the back of low-paid immigrant workers. Well, and it's also <laughs> built on a flow of people, of working-aged people, into the workforce. What you want to do is to expand the working pool. It is so wrongheaded, so opposite of all the things we want our immigration policy to accomplish to have quotas, limited quotas like we do, and a slow, arduous process. You want the opposite of that in order to benefit the, to have the benefits that you want. Here's, here's an analogy. It used to be that when people had the kind of hip surgery that I had a year ago, they would say to the person, we need to have you in the hospital for five days. Mm -hmm. Then we don't want you putting any weight on it. We want to wait for the healing to start. And then you can slowly start to integrate regular activity. Yeah. That was the old storyline. Right. That's our current way that the Trump administration wants to talk about immigration. Slow it down. Restriction. Stop. The new way that when you have a surgery, the same day, literally the day of their surgery, they're like up on your feet, start walking on that thing. Movement and use is what's going to help your body respond. This is the same thing with immigration. What we need are more border crossing points, more freedom for people to enter the country, more work visas, and a better tracking system so people can come and go effortlessly and not get stuck in a loop by which their application to immigrate into the United States like is a microchip 7, or something? 10, or 15 years down the road. Like what's happening with some of these parents who get separated from the kids, uh, the, the reason they're trying to now separate them is because what was happening in the past was someone would come in and ask for asylum, or they would come in and ask to immigrate. And they would be given an ankle brace and let free into the country with a court date set. They oh, would really? Come back. Yes. They would come back. It's, it's what the Trump administration calls catch and release. So the person would identify themselves or be caught. Then they would have an ankle bracelet put on. Then they would have a court date set. When they would go back for their court date, what the Trump administration tells you is they don't show up for their court date. That's not what's happening. They go back for their court date, and the court says, we're too full. We're going to postpone your court date for six months. Then they come back again. We're too full. We're going to postpone it another six months. People end up in a multi-year delay process to have their application for asylum or for immigration looked at. So now they're in this limbo period where they're technically not legal immigrants and then are called illegal immigrants in the country because the system cannot process them. So what the Trump administration says was rather than doing that process, we're going to incarcerate them so they're not roaming free because they thought this free roaming people who we haven't said yes to makes them illegal immigrants. That's what's been happening. So the answer to that is not to lock them up. The answer to that is to speed up the process of immigration. This is what Democrats don't talk about. We need to increase the number of visas, work visas given, the number of immigration uh, 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 green cards that are given. We need to increase the number of us, not go the other way. It's totally backward. Yeah, it's hard to get a lot of energy to fund that stuff um, when you're talking about letting more immigrants in. Do you know what's, do you know what it's cheaper than? $50 billion for a wall. Like th- 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 it is, it is, it is up. Op- it's like Freaky Friday with the Trump administration. They're just literally wrong on everything they do. It, f- from my vantage point, they're wrong on tariffs. I know that some of the Bernie Sanders supporters think they're right on tariffs. They're wrong on tariffs. They're wrong on the border. They're wrong on taxes. They're wrong on their tone. They're just wrong over and over and over. And some people say, "Why, why do you keep complaining about this?" Well, because that's my role. <laughs> I want to be the guy. I want to be the guy that people say, Doug Padgett. I, I don't know a lot Gadfly. about this, but but I have a friend, or I listen to somebody, and <clears throat> he's right. They're wrong. I don't know totally why they're wrong, but I don't have to. It's kind of like the way I I go about buying uh, food prepared at a grocery store. I just trust there's someone back there that's, that's washing their hands, that's prepared their food properly. <laughs> Hey, here's the thing with this. Um, All right. And then, and then but, you know, we got to talk about fun stuff. Yeah, I think it's in the morning. Uh, people can have whatever opinions they want on this. Uh, I don't, I don't, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm, I mean, I don't give a shit. But look, <laughs> at least do two things for me. One, 
have a relationship with a poor person. Oh. Okay. Okay. And or black person and or Latino. Okay. Which are sometime all in one. And have a relationship with some immigrants. Yeah. Work with some immigrants. Yeah. Right. Like work in a kitchen. Yeah. You know, with some uh, Uruguayans. Yeah. Nice point. And watch those guys bust their ass and do a great job. Yeah. Um, and uh, put you in the dust as far as their uh, work ethic goes. I mean, just have a relationship with some of these people to eliminate them from being this nebulous mm-hmm, mm-hmm, enemy. Mm-hmm. Um, that these are that these are people, and I understand that you you know I mean I'm bleeding, being a bleeding heart or whatever, mm-hmm. but it's just part of part of humanity because uh, you know we, we we all speak as if our voices had like decision making yeah, abilities, yeah. right? And so. In what we're saying, we are, you know, we are supporting or tearing down somebody, a real person that's behind these issues. So, mm-hmm. you know, then we can talk. It reminds me of that. I think it's great advice. And it reminds me of that, old, that, that, that sassy thing that, uh, that teenagers would say to their moms when their mom would say, eat, eat all the food on your plate. There's kids starving in Africa. And the kid would say, oh, yeah, name one. Right. Do you know any mom? Right. Right. But but that's the point is that it loses a lot of power when it's when everything is just ubiquitous and anonymous and those people and we don't know. And the same way with advocates, the same way with people that are like, because I get I get some real strong pushback and some things I posted on the Internet from people who are saying, hey, Doug, have you ever lived in a border state? Which I do live in a border state. So, yes, I have. And you've lived in Texas. And, I, and I've lived in Texas. And they said, well. Close border towns. Do you know what it's like to be infiltrated by all of these all of these immigrants? To which my earlier point is apropos. If you made immigration easier, more open, more efficient, more cost effective, and faster, people wouldn't pool up in the towns immediately surrounding the border. The reason they have to stay there is because they got a friggin' ankle bracelet and they have to come back for uh, in four weeks for a trial. That's the whole reason. Um, yeah, uh, my uh, opinion uh, is the city was probably shitty before the immigrants got there. <laughs> I think you're probably right. <laughs> At least I was Sorry, yeah, I So anyway, I love the sound. It just oh, it's so. Hey, did you see this story? Uh, st- staying on the on the immigration uh, line, did you see this this story Jesus, Doug. about the jogger? Yes, Robin actually told me this this morning. Okay, yeah. Recap the story, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll fill in the details that I know from reading. It. Okay, so there is a uh, a French woman um, who uh, flew to Canada to visit her mother, right in British Columbia. And uh, so she is in British Columbia, which is in Canada, and uh, was going for apparently along the border, was going for a run. Yes. um, And the tide was coming in or something like that. So she kind of was running and she stopped to take a picture. And then she was approached by some American border guards. Yeah. She she's a 19 year old. Mistakenly. African-American. Or black. African, not okay, American. Sorry. I, I don't mean any. I'm just stupid. <laughs> African French. Just African. <laughs> Wait a minute. What? Just French. There's an other category? Yeah. Africa, <laughs> yeah. So it's that joke about the kid that goes to Africa. says, Mom, look at all the African Americans. Yeah. Um, yeah they're, Franco-African? That's, yeah. Frank. I think she's just a French citizen. Okay. It doesn't matter what color she uh, is. Yeah. Sadella, except it does. Sadella Roma. Except it does because she presents as non-European, non-white. And a lot of people suggest that that is a real piece of the puzzle mm-hmm. here. Um, so she stopped to take that picture, turns around, sees two border guards coming toward her. And she's like, hey, what's up? Doesn't speak, you know, a lot of uh, a, a lot of American, and um, they said, "Hey, you've uh, you've crossed into the United States." And she's like, "Really? Like up in British Columbia and Washington State? Like it's just a beach, and you? It's like being in the Boundary Waters here in Minnesota for people that have experienced that. Like it's it, there's there's there are literally no markers. That, that's just a that there's a lake. What, and you then mean there's, there's a like a giant a dotted line that goes across no. the state like on a map? And it's funny because you look on the map and there it is, and you get there and you're that's like, clear. where's the where's yeah. where, where's the line? So they put her into a caged vehicle, took all of her uh, her <clears throat> jewelry from her because they were like, well, do you have a passport? Do you have any ID? And she's like, well, no, I'm out for a jog. Yeah, yeah. Which by the way, CNN. She's a runner, not a jogger. Could we just be done with the jogger language? They're runners. 
they're all runners. Jogging is a is a is a it's a it's a it's a low class uh, term for somebody who's a runner. She's clearly out on a run. Like Jogger's World is not the magazine; it's Runner's World. We will unpack this next episode. <laughs> some, some point, take it. Jeez. Some point, take it later. So the U.S. Border Control uh, gets a hold of her on May 21st and then keeps her for two weeks. They got her passports. They got her travel documents after some phone calls. Like here's somebody that just disappears, gets a hold of her mom. They have to get all of her, all of her inf- information. And then the Immigration and Customs Enforcement people up in the border of Canada and Washington State, British Columbia, say, if an individual, this is a quote, enters the United States at a location other than an official port of entry and without the inspection of a Customs and Border Protection officer, they have illegally entered the United States and will be prosecuted accordingly. And because the Attorney General has said that there is a zero tolerance for illegally crossing the border. If a person crosses into the United States at an unofficial checkpoint without being checked, they are now an illegal immigrant that has crossed into the country. Thanks, Trudeau. This is so, this is the ridiculousness of, of this. And then they go on to say, it is the responsibility of an individual traveling in the vicinity of an international border to maintain awareness of their surroundings and their locations at all times to ensure that they do not illegally cross the border. That's legit, but I mean, come on. No, it's not legit. What do you mean it's not legit? That it's on. You the- got people just wandering willy nilly across the border as if it's, you know. To, to claim it as illegal because you didn't know the markings on a beach of where – there is no possible way that you could know on that beach where the line of demarcation is from one to the other when the tide's coming Did go. she take that picture with a camera or with her phone? Well, you think the you think the phone's going to have a location that's going to tell you I'm now in Canada? If you're it's within, got a GPS, yes. If you're in six feet, eight feet, 12 feet of the border – I mean, she was not more than, she was feet inside the border. What they've done in Mexico to solve this problem is they've created a zone, a hundred mile zone from the border. And they've said, you know what we're not going to do? We're not going to fuss with anyone in that zone because it's just ridiculous to be bickering about the line. Give them a hundred miles. What do they do in, in, in Canada? I mean, finally, you know, the, the, the ICE patrol, the immigration and customs enforcement people, the little ICERs, they're so fired up, they got to grab a runner, referring to her as a jogger. Ugh. I wonder if she would have, like, ran towards the border, what would have happened? And dove across back into Canada and yeah. freedom. Like, they probably just would have filled her full of bullets. Yeah, if they, if they and, ran and, from and, this, and I do, like... But the, this being the point, it's ridiculous. The entire protect the border of this country, we can have no one cross it. That's what's just not only un-American, but just ridiculous. Um, yes. Okay. And... You know, look, these guys are like bored stiff up there. I'm sure it just made their week. Yes, you totally. know, to bring this person in and get to use all their toys and stuff. They're seeing all the all the guy, all, all their coworkers <clears throat> down on the southern border getting all this action of splitting up families, and they're like, "I want to protect this country." It's like, what do you want to do with her? Let's put her From, in the back of the truck. You no, know, like the re- way back, yeah, not the back seat, the cage, the cage. I mean, this is this, this is the part that just makes you t- turn a, uh, an eye toward of 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 satire toward these people like really that's you you feel like you're really protecting the u.s because uh a runner didn't know her whereabouts and crossed the border yeah they could have said yeah get away go away all right should we finish on a little a little good news yeah hey cancer studies have indicated that there's a certain amount of drinks you can have three a week if they're small it's definitive like, now. Like alcoholic beverages? Alcoholic beverages, yeah. Your, your risk of cancer... That's supposed to make me feel good, Doug? ...is not going to go up if you have uh, three a week. Small ones. Yep. I'm sure that's not like within an hour? Nope, nope, that's, it's in a week. Yeah, three a week. So, I mean, that, that's great news. It's great news. You can have three drinks a week. And in, in, in related news, the... Uh, 
Four uh, cups of coffee is supposed to help you but, not have cancer. Did I just step on your next point? No, no, you've 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 led right into it. It's okay. it's, it's it's exactly the point, and that is around uh, hydration. So if you're not going to hydrate yourself on any more than three alcoholic drinks a week, now, <clears throat> and that doesn't mean I checked. You can't have three of them on Saturday night and then start a new week on Sunday. You can't you can't pull the old first day of the week trick. And drink three more the next day. So you can't like drink They've got to be three at 11 o'clock <laughs> and then three after midnight. Three after midnight. And then you're like, and hey. say it's Sunday. And say that was, that's got to be good. Cancer. Can't send a, uh, you, can't, you, you can't claim the. <laughs> Cancer's not that smart. Hey, you should have known that you, that you crossed the, uh, the date line. Uh, but it's on, it's on uh, the tips for hydrating. So, mm. so my tips, instead of being mindfulness tips for your health, the mm-hmm. health of John as a 52-year-old man. Mm. Now have to do with hydration. So careful on the on the more than three drinks, but mm-hmm. but push the boundary there because cancer is not going to befall you on three drinks a year, uh, three drinks a week. You're supposed to. <laughs> here's some tips on hydrating. And this is where your coffee comes in. If you feel sluggish and irritated for no good reason when you wake up in the morning, instead of feeling rested and refreshed, do you know what it could be? Not just an unquieted mind, not just the fact that you got in your phone within 14 seconds of, of awakening. You might be one in three Americans who have some kind of mild insomnia that has been created by being dehydrated. Mm. Dehydration, primary cause of mild insomnia. That sense that you don't feel well rested in the morning, that you feel groggy because you're not hydrated. So this is advice for a 51-year-old man. Yes. I drink a bunch of water before I go yes, to bed so I can wake up three times a night is, to piss. This is, this, is what, huh? well, this is what I'm getting at. I'm fucking mainlining saw palmetto <laughs> so I can just sleep six hours without wetting the bed. Well, I'm just saying for you, it's also the cause of snoring and hoarseness. Oh, I thought you were going to say horniness. <laughs> oh, it's like, the That's a curveball. It's, it's actually the opposite of that. Yeah, really? your, yeah your sperm output uh, and, and ejaculate output mm. uh, is also uh, uh, diminished with dehydration. But luckily, <laughs> that makes sense. But luckily, experts <laughs> have identified an optimal hydration schedule that you can follow to ensure that you're drinking enough water throughout the oh, day Christ. so you can sleep like a baby when the time comes. And you're going to give us the schedule? Here are the guidelines you need to follow to maintain near perfect levels of hydration throughout the day. Damn slave to water. Number one, uh, if possible, wait two or three hours after you awaken before you drink coffee. Okay. So, hey, you know what causes <laughs> irritability and sluggishness in the morning? So cancer, Waiting two hours to have coffee. You, cancer prevention. Set aside. <clears throat> wait two or three hours before you uh, have that first bit of coffee and hydrate rather with water because coffee, as we all know, is a expectorant. Expectorant is that the word? No. Yeah. <laughs> no what is, it's a, it dehydrates you. It's a whatever the word is. I'm thinking of a different it, joke right now. It, 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 it dehydrates. I can't you. be your dictionary. Uh, number two. Yeah. Make sure that you're consuming water with all of your meals. Now, there is an old-time myth circulate, myth that's circulating that drinking waters during your meals will dilute your stomach acid, making it harder for, harder for your body to absorb nutrients. That's what the British believe. That's what my uh, naturopath believes. That's what my wife believes. And that's what I believe. But I'm still telling you this, trip, this tip because they say that is an old-timey myth that has been proven false and, quote, simply is not true. Drinking water during meals actually helps your body in digestion. This is, this is why I believe science is real. I just don't know which science it is that's real. It helps your dig- digestion because it helps your stomach liquefy food and thereby absorb your nutrients. So consume more water with your food also helps prevent constipation, which is also a problem in nutrient absorption. Can you believe that? Number three. Get your water, John, by eating foods that are high in water content. Drink water, eat watery foods. Now you're probably saying to yourself, like, what watery foods? What did a guy eat? Like soups. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> like, come up, with, come up with a list of hydrating foods. <laughs> Soup. <laughs> Jelly, <laughs> sports drink. 
Come on. <laughs> <Soup>. <laughs> uh, so good. Sodium doesn't get you in the water, get in there. I think I'm just dehydrated. All right, no. Many vegetables and fruits have a high water content, uh, including, of course, how many freaking stalks of celery you're going to have to eat <laughs> yeah, but to <laughs> equal a cup of water? <laughs> including, of course, watermelon. Instead of, you can start with watermelon. Oh, we're good. We're good three soup. months out of the year. <laughs> instead of soup. Uh, strawberries, cucumbers, celery, oranges, spinach, cantaloupe. The good news is that all of these foods are not only n- nutritious to your daily dose of water, but they have a good amount of... And they're fiber. also not diuretics, uh, they're which not, is what coffee does. Which is the word I was looking for. It it's took a me like diuretic. seven minutes to come up with uh, that. I know. I think it only got to me. I only got to you because the laugh hormones. Yeah, released it. Number four: avoid drinking caffeine for a period six hours before going to bed. Now you put the math together: two hours after you get up, six hours before you go to bed, you can have a little caffeine between. Nine and two. <laughs> and that's about it. And then some people can't have any caffeine after noon. So basically they're like, cut the caffeine and grab a uh, beverage that doesn't is not a diuretic. Uh, uh, keep it on your desk. And finally, number five, drink a glass of water before you go to bed. There's an entire article that is written that basically tells you to drink more water, drink less coffee, and all this to alleviate uh, that feeling in the morning. So that's your health tip. Hey, how's your uh, night sweats? Uh, they're not good. Really? Yeah, you know, still, I, I kind of made fun of you the other day. The, the, still you, a little sweaty. Really? Right? Yeah. I had an instance happen to me the other day. We went to Ikea. Yeah. And uh, so just real quick, I got up early mm-hmm. and I had a couple of energy drinks in my fridge. Okay. <laughs> okay. And a shot. Like I had gotten for work, put in the refrigerator and forgot. The, a shot of what? Oh, a uh, <laughs> six-hour energy shot. Oh, oh. oh my God. Wow. Um, so I brought those with me because I did. You I know, think they're actually eight-hour energy, but I like the, the way that you've rounded down so well, you can take more than. That's right. Take more than one. Um, so I like, you know, I did one energy drink on the dr- drive, you know, wow. where I was going. And then I, on, in transit, I took the shot. And I did take a, a, a nootropic called um, Alpha Brain, which is uh, not really caffeine, but it's supposed to like make you more alert and yeah, stuff because yeah. it works on your brain chemicals. Yeah, unbelievable. And uh, so then uh, I, I get to the, the house and do the shit that I was, had to get done. So I, I did that other energy drink, you know, because <laughs> uh, I was thirsty. It was, it was probably more than eight hours between energy drinks, I'm sure. 50 minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> And so and then I come home, you know, and then so that we're going to go uh, to, um, you know, Ikea, you know, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then on the way to Ikea, I stop by the CVS and I get me another energy drink. <laughs> and then we, so then we go to, uh, then we go to Ikea and we like to, you know, eat before we go on our adventure. You know, oh, you start, you start eating. You yeah. Don't, you don't finish. No. You don't finish in the cafe. Oh, no, no, no. You kick it off. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, so, you know, I had the Swedish meatballs and, uh, and I had two cups of coffee. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> Swear to G. So we're walk, starting to walk around Ikea. <laughs> and so, and like, you are floating. M- m- sweat is just pouring <laughs> off my face. Oh. I mean, and just like, just wipe and dr- like you're in Guatemala, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And, uh, and my face is like beet red. And it takes me, like, this is happening for like 45 minutes. And I'm like, okay, my pulse isn't that bad. You know, I'm not feeling like super like, eh, but something is happening with my metabolism. And uh, and then I remembered, well, maybe it had something to do with that caffeine. I had. <laughs> and I started to do the math. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm probably going to have a heart attack here. Yeah. And so then I go into the Ikea bathroom to, you know, splash some cool water on my face. Yes. Well, first of all, it has the motion faucets. Yeah. I'm apparently invisible to those things. I, aren't we all? It just makes you feel like you don't count in the world. You think you're Tyler Durden. You just you wave your hand. Yep, it's like shh. Yep. That's how much water I get, yeah, yeah. and it's boiling hot water. <laughs> <laughs> so I splash boiling hot water on my face. No paper towels. Yeah. Just the Dyson hand blowers. Yeah. And you can't so I've get got your face in there. One hand in the blower, and the other hand trying to channel air to my face, <laughs> which is also boiling hot. By the way, and your hands are shaking. Are you shaking at this point? Are you having a, like a caffeine energy drink? It, 
you know, it, it was such a bizarre feeling. Um, but it was really just manifesting and like to the, oh, in your face, in my face, in my head. And like, as we're leaving, I sweat as if I had just uh, come from the gym and I get in the car, I hand robbing the keys. I'm like, Hey, I don't know what's going to happen here. So you better be dry yeah. in case it happens <laughs> on the way home. Put those air conditioning vents yeah. in my face. Ugh, finally in heaven. Do you know what I've heard gives somebody a whole lot more energy? What's that? Being well hydrated when they sleep at night. I'm going to look into that. You should look into that. You should give that a try. Mm -hmm. Morning, John. Good morning, Doug. Thanks, everybody. Good morning, America. It's morning in America. Remember those commercials? Mm -hmm. I think that was Clinton. It's morning in America. Where are you? Goodbye, Internet. You know, in in Robbinsdale, we have sirens that go off at 9 p.m. Every night? Every night. No. Yes. Why is that? It's curfew. Get your damn kids inside. No. Yes. There is a curfew siren in Robbinsdale. Mm-hmm. And we don't, I live in Crystal, but I mean... You, you, the you can hear it from there. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. 10 o'clock. Do you know where your kids are? We should do an interview with the city manager sometime about this. Uh, no? I got Nothing in, there? I got into a tiff with him. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, Larry David? <laughs> <laughs> this guy, this kid, had posted right. on his social media. He he was working as a yeah. uh, as a ground as a sports in the yeah, sports yeah. area or whatever, and uh, he had uh, criticized this rule that they had uh, yeah. established, and they fired the kid. <laughs> okay, and I. Exp- How did you find out about this? The kid used to be my neighbor when I when I lived in oh, Robinsdale okay. years right, ago. You knew him. He's an upstanding uh, young kid, a future. Yeah. Um, um, uh, productive citizen. And so you called the city manager and said, I'd like to have some words with you? Um, well, yeah. I'm like, uh, uh, first of all, uh, <laughs> your voicemail is not activated. <laughs> it is, I, after I you tried that. You clearly become that old man that's in Robbinsdale that's, that's got, got a list of grievances. And then, I, you know, so I got his email address. I, I had to do some searching for that and yeah. uh, sent him an email and received one back like, you know, three, you know, three or four days later. Uh-huh. Saying I'm not allowed to discuss, uh, you know. Employee, personnel issues. Yeah, personnel issues. Yeah. And my voicemail is set up. No, it's not. What, what font did he use to have that tone? In the email, uh, I just uh, I maybe I think you might read emails as you are, not as <laughs> they were intended. It's that old Max. Anyway, so the city manager is out, but anyway, yeah, we could talk to somebody. Don't you think there should be a chance to kind of like bridge the bridge the the, the animus between yeah, us? Yeah, yeah, that we go to his office and and interview him about the siren, and only then do you real do you reveal that you are the same one that. That came to the defense of. I'll the, have a copy of my email. Yeah, at the, you show him right at the slide across the table to him right at the end, like on sixty minutes. What do you have to say about this? Yeah, one more thing. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll do a Columbo sixty minutes combo. <laughs> one more thing before I go. Could you respond to this? Yes. Hey, that was a little bonus for y'all. You sure. Are still for sticking your, around for here on the, on the podcast because you know you want more than an hour. Mm-hmm. What hour. is that thing? It's, an, it's a camera that fell over. Oh, okay. That's like right. pointed at your crotch the whole no, show. No, it's it's not on. But oh, okay. I can't, I can't I can't see the I can't see the turn off button. Oh. On the, on the podcast, what's going on? Right but now. you're you're too high. You're gonna need to go down and scroll down. Scroll down. I'm trying to, but I, it's what's happening here. All right. So those who are just still listening. well, this is on the bottom screen. Is that supposed know, to be? There? I'm supposed to go down to the bottom screen right there. Give it a good swipe. Good swipe. I'm trying to. I'm literally trying to get there. It is. I, I have multiple monitors in our in our uh, studio here, mm-hmm. two on top of each other, one behind us. And mm-hmm. I, I had thought I had them properly stacked so they could, you know, move my mouse. Uh, they still call that a mouse. They call it a pointer if I'm using a, a track pad. Track pad. Mm. Anyway, I couldn't I couldn't stop recording, so we just had to keep talking because it wasn't like I was going to stop talking and then it we're just gonna, had that dead air. Yeah, I could just come back and edit that out later, but right, I, I mean, don't like to do edits. No. It's too, it's time you get the raw feed. <laughs> That's right. Why are you laughing at the word raw? Doug? I don't know. Just the way you huh? said raw feed. <laughs> Somehow it's like some sort of a, I don't know. It's dirty, isn't yeah, it? It's dirty. <laughs> 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 and I'm uncomfortable now. All right. 
Good morning, America. How are, How are you? you? What is that song? That's a song, isn't it? Yeah. Huh. Like if we had a theme song. The thing is time. Yeah. All right. Hey, goodbye, everyone. Is that Arlo Guthrie or something? I don't know.